Hi, this is Karen. I'm here again today with Brett. Um, Brett, is it okay if everybody knows your last name? Yeah, it's uh, Anderson. Yeah. Brett Anderson. And uh, we are talking about goodness, truth, and beauty today. Um, I ran into Brett through the um, Jordan Peterson, Paul Vanderclay community on the internet. And, uh, and Brett has really looked into Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning and has some um, other things to add to it. And so I'm going to let you go ahead, talk about goodness, truth, and beauty from that perspective. Sure, sure. So the idea was that that the true, the good, and the beautiful all emerge at the border between order and chaos. And and so we're going to talk about, about beauty last. Um, so I'll start with truth. And so if you've, if you watch Jordan Peterson, uh, he talks a lot about Jean Piaget. So Jean Piaget is known as a developmental psychologist, but he considered himself to be a genetic epistemologist, which means that he was trying to understand the genesis of epistemology. He was trying to understand how we come to know the world, how we come to, to have knowledge about the world. And, and so Jean Piaget, uh, and really what he was trying to do, uh, he was trying to to build a bridge between science and religion, right? This is something that, that many people don't know about Jean Piaget, but that was his primary goal. Uh, anyway, so he had these ideas of assimilation and accommodation, right? And assimilation is where you have a, a cognitive structure. So this could be beliefs, skills, sensory motor routines, right? It, it could be very simple things like the ability to grasp, right? But it could be all the way up to very complex beliefs and just, just a cognitive structure. And you're using that cognitive structure to act in the world, right? So you're, you're using that cognitive structure to affect changes in the world, right? You're assimilating the world to the structure. Uh, accommodation is sort of the opposite of that. It's where you have the cognitive structure, you're presented with an anomaly, right? The cognitive structure isn't working the way that you want it to, or the, it's not, it's not uh, bringing your goals about in the world. And so you have to change the cognitive structure. And right? so you're accommodating, your, you're accommodating yourself to the world. Now, the reason why, why this is related to, to order and chaos is because when you're in a state of order, when you know what you're doing, uh, when, you, when you have a, a grip on the world, you want to assimilate, or you wanna act in the world. Um, and when you don't, when you're in a state of chaos, when you cannot handle the anomaly, when the anomaly uh, is, is, is sort of too much for your current structures, you have to accommodate, you have to allow your structures to dissolve and, and, and something uh, better to reemerge. And, and there are ways that you can fall off towards either of these ends, right? You don't want to do too much of either. So if you, if you assimilate too much, if you go, if you fall off towards assimilation, you become rigid, right? Because then it's, it's as if no anomaly will, will, will challenge your cognitive structures, right? Like they're, they're rigid. They're not, they're not going to change for anything. Uh, and that's a pathology of order, right? It's a pathology of assimilation. And if you, if you have too much accommodation, what happens is that you're giving too much importance to anomalies because the fact is that no cognitive structure is ever complete. No cognitive structure is ever going to account for everything. And you can't just fall apart at every anomaly, or you can't just allow your beliefs and your, and your values to fall apart at every anomaly, right? And so okay, that's so a- could I, could I throw in a, something here that's occurring to me? So when you get too much, assimilate, too much assimilation, rigid, basically it's, you, you know everything. You think you know everything. Yes, yes. So you're not taking in any new knowledge. Yes. And when you fall too much into accommodation, that's the postmodern dilemma where you can't know anything. Right, right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yes. And so on one side, you have sort of, yes, you, you have this idea where everything I currently know is, is enough, right? I don't need to know anything, anything new because uh, what I know now is enough. And that's sort of the uh, Jordan in Maps of Meaning calls that a pathology of fascism. Uh, but on the other side, you have everything is arbitrary, everything is relative, history is, is arbitrary and all this. And, uh, and that's the pathology of, of decadence, as Jordan would call it. It's, it's too much accommodation. Um, and it's a pathology of chaos. And so you want to straddle the border between those, right? And, and, and truth emerges there. So uh, Jean Piaget, in his book, Genetic Epistemology, talks about truth as a process, and which is somewhat different than, than we usually talk about it, because most people, when they talk about truth, they talk about it sort of a, with, a, with a capital T, 
that there are there are certain truths in the world and in in some ways there are because you know we have mathematical truths but those are kind of uh, we set up the rules of the game and then the mathematical truths follow, follow from that. So we're not actually discovering things that are in the world, right? We're building a system, but that's different from empirical truths. Well, uh, could, we, could we differentiate truth, the quest for truth from truth? So the quest for truth is a process. Well, truth itself is something else. Is that a possibility? So, so yes. Uh, I would say that we need to make sure we, we understand that when you're dealing with facts in the world, when you're doing, dealing with empirical facts in the world, there is no stable truth. Uh, there is no truth with a capital T. And this is the postmodern critique. Mm -hmm. But the postmodernists, in response to this, they, they sort of throw up their hands and say, well, then everything is arbitrary and relative. But no, it is, the, the idea would be that, no, instead, you, you should think of truth as a process, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we can get, you know... Um, you know, we don't want to get into sort of the semantics of that. I, I understand what you're saying, and I yeah. agree uh, that you need to have a concept of truth. You know, like like this is true, and that's not true. And I agree with that. But well, uh, but the, the idea is reason I think that reason I think that's necessary is that without something to strive for, you know, Jordan's always talking about looking at the star that's above the horizon, the, the greatest good of which you can conceive. That's your aim. And without that aim, nothing else lines up. So you have to have an aim. And the, it, to us, the aim looks like a moving target because every time we get a little bit further along the road, the aim seems to move, but, but that's in our perception, not in reality. So the aim has to actually be there or we have no reason to move forward. Well, Jordan no capacity to move forward, according mm -hmm. to Jordan Peterson. So, mm -hmm. well, in in Maps of Meaning, Jordan talks about the highest aim as being a process, and yeah. he talks about yeah. aiming at a process. Right. So, uh, so you're not aiming at anything anything static, right? It's it's you're aiming to enact this process, um, which which keeps you at the border between order and chaos. Right. Um, and so and so truth emerges from that, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it's not. And so when we're dealing with empirical facts in the world. The idea is that it's it's the world is sort of like a an infinite onion. You know, you, you're never going to get to the bottom of it, but that doesn't mean that it's all arbitrary and relative. Some things are more true than others, right? Mm -hmm. Some things fit you to the world. You know, the way that the, this is why Jordan talks about the pragmatic notion of truth, right? Because Jordan recognizes the postmodern conundrum, right? Jordan recognizes that that when you're talking about empirical facts in the world, certainty is not guaranteed in anything. But his critique of the postmodernists is that they, as I said, they sort of throw their hands in the air and say, well, then it's all arbitrary. But, but Jordan says no, because, you know, some ideas kill you and that's not arbitrary. Right. And uh, some ideas fit you to the world better than others. You know, some uh, some beliefs will allow you to bring about your desired states in the world better than others. And that but means that they're in some sense. when you align with reality. Right. Yes. When yes. your being aligns with reality. Yes, uh, and and, the, and in in those beliefs are more true than the alternatives, right? That doesn't mean that they're true for now and always, right? That doesn't mean that they're they're not something better is not going to come along, mm -hmm. but in the, in the moment they're truer than the alternative, and so, and so that's why you know Jean Piaget talks about truth as a process, right? As a as a as a process as the process by which you become more fitted to the world, and that 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 uh, that greater fittedness to the world emerges at the border between order and chaos, right? Because you can become too rigid. Too much order or you can just allow your cognitive structures to fall apart and that's too much chaos right and and so that's how this plays out with with truth so we can move on to to the good yeah yeah when so, we get to beauty i'm gonna i'm gonna loop back around to this assimilation and accommodation because i think there's an important connection sure. yeah yeah sounds good so an important question i think when we're talking about the good is whether or not whether or not there is good out there in the universe or out there in the world that we can participate in or whether uh, it's something that we come up with, right? And, and it's something that we sort of impose onto the world. So I'm gonna make the argument that there is good in the world and that we can participate in it, right? So that the, in, in some sense it's objective, which is very, uh, I would say at odds with the way that most modern people think about it. but. But this is the argument that I'm going to make. And so the idea is that 
if you believe that life is good and if you believe that being is good, right? And these are sort of the foundational, these are sort of axioms, right? Right. You have to believe that being is good in order for the rest of the argument to follow. But, uh, and this is what Jordan talks about in, in Maps of Meaning that the, the hero, right, you know, has, has faith in, in the goodness of being, but the adversary says, the adversary judges being uh, as, as being not worth existing at all, right? That's the adversarial stance. So, so if you believe that being is good, then the process that produces being is good. And that process is the process of complexification, which, which I think is uh, represented by the, the process that, that represents the mythological hero figure. It's this life, death, and rebirth process uh, it's, it's the establishment of order, an anomaly occurs, you have a descent into chaos, a reemergence into a higher order, which is a higher level of complexity. And my, my hypothesis, which I talked about with Paul, is that that process plays out at every level of reality, uh, from the smallest levels to the largest, oh, right? Yeah. right. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about every level here, but, um, and that this process is intimately related to self-organized criticality. Uh, because in, in Per Bach, in his book, he makes the case that that all complexity in nature uh, is underlied by self-organized criticality. The self-organized criticality underlies the emergence of all complexity in nature. And so, and so, you don't get life without complexity. You don't get being without complexity. Um, and so, that process, the, the the enactment of that process, is the good. Right. That's that's the that's the the, the hypothesis that I'm going to put forward. And and that complexity emerges at the border between order and chaos. And we see how this plays out in, uh, so in biological evolution, uh, Per Bach in his book talks about punctuated equilibrium, but in terms of that, that life death rebirth process, I, I talked about this a little bit with Paul, the idea is that you have sort of an ecosystem that's in a relatively stable state. Uh, we can talk about the, the Cambrian explosion, which is sort of the, the paradigmatic example of this. So before the Cambrian explosion, you had very simple forms of life. The, I think the leading hypothesis is that uh, the idea of a predator was stumbled upon by evolution. So you had a, you had you know a series of mutations that created the first predator, and then from that, everything you know there was this explosion of diversity in response to these um, these sort of uh, these arms races between predators and prey, and so you get the Cambrian explosion. So that's where you have a stable state. Right, you have this anomaly that occurs in the system, which is the first predator comes along, and then you have this explosion of diversity, and then you have the, the, the settling down into a new stable state. Right, so that's the same thing as that, that order anomaly descent into chaos reemergence into a higher level of complexity, because after the Cambrian explosion, you do get more complex entities. Okay, so, and then at the cultural level, uh, Robert Wright talks in, in Non Zero, uh, his book Non Zero talks about the uh, increasing cultural complexity over time, uh, which emerges through the increasing scope of cooperative groups through, uh, through non-zero-sum games. And so a non-zero-sum game is where the parts of a system align their interests uh, to create a new whole, right? Um, and so the idea is that, for example, single-celled organisms become a multicellular organism because they are able to align their interests, right? And then once they align their interests, they end up evolving into this into this uh, multicellular conglomerate. But the idea is that that plays out at cultural uh, at the cultural level as well, because, for example, when people came into get, came together into a civilization, right? When different tribes came together into a civilization, they had to find a way to align their interests so that they could exist in peace with each other. And the idea is that this this increasing scope of cooperation has been going on uh, for you know since evolution has been going on and that this is an increase in complexity because what you get is you get uh, more integrated groups but simultaneously they become more differentiated because things specialize within the group so for example when you get the increase in cultural complexity you also get the increase in the division of labor and so people become more specialized uh, and more differentiated from each other and 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 so that's an increase in complexity uh, integrate simultaneous uh, increase in integration and differentiation is an increase Complexity. Okay. And the idea down, would be that let, that let, process is good. And yeah, let's slow down just a little bit here. Because <laughs> sure. so many things are coming up. I mean, what's coming up in my mind is all sorts of economic uh, discussions and, and all of these things. When you start talking about um, uh, differentiating um, responsibilities so that the 
so that you can go from very simple economies to more complex economies. Mm -hmm. Underlying all of that, there, there has to be some sort of impulse to align interests. Um, it's not a natural impulse in the human now you can talk about these things all you want before you get to the human level, but once you get to the human level and you have consciousness, it's not a natural impulse to align our interests with another. Mm -hmm. Because in order to do that, there's almost always some level of risk and sacrifice involved in, mm -hmm. in being willing to make that alignment. Mm -hmm. Now, is your argument that that uh, whatever it is that allows us to go beyond the fear of risk and sacrifice in order to align ourselves with the interests of another, that that thing evolved in us um, well, because, of a, at, because at the social level, it was required that it, I mean, that, that that is something that emerges out of the requirement of, of the evolutionary process in the, so, at the social level. Uh, so the idea would be that it, it happened because of competition, because more cooperative groups or, or, or group, larger groups anyways are more com more competitive and they would simply take over. Uh, uh, and so the idea is that groups that, that were able to to get through that barrier, right, because there is a barrier there, there is risk and, and, and all that involved in, in increasing these uh, more uh, uh, scaled up groups. But groups that were able to able to overcome that barrier outcompeted other groups, and then that uh, the norms and traditions that allowed them to do that became, uh, you know, more common through the process of cultural group selection, right? And so that's sort of that sort of Robert Wright's argument. Now, the the problem with that argument is that it stops now because because we're at the point where we're at a, at a sort of global we're at the global scale where it's not going to be competition, right? That that because the only the next step that we have is is a you know if we if we continue on with this process is sort of a global community right well competition can't what are we competing with right we're, we're not competing with anything at the global scale right so uh so my my hypothesis there we, we can get into this my hypothesis there is that actually agape is the solution to that problem um and, yeah, and we, yeah we can, absolutely i mean that has to be that has to be at the heart of the whole thing because because that's at the top and at the bottom and it keeps coming back down around and, and refreshing and yeah. Okay. Okay. I follow you. I follow you then because if you just go that direction, you don't even have to get to a global scale for that problem to occur. That problem has occurred over and over and over again in history as it, as this thing has built itself up into this huge, whatever the conglomerate is, whether it's slaveholders or whether it's the Roman empire or whether it's the mafia, it always comes to the same problem. And <laughs> I was watching some dumb fringe episode last night and, and it's like the only thing that ever saves the good guys is that the bad guys always start fighting with each other. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, this, is, this is a Piagetian idea, right? Because his idea was that, um, and I think we may have talked about this a little bit the last time, right? I talked about these ideas of, of the dominance strategy where you, you're using force and intimidation to get to the top of the hierarchy and the envy strategy where you're tearing down the top and then the prestige strategy, which is where you're, you're, you're using your competence, right? And people are voting you to the top. And the idea is that the other strategies, which are sort of the adversarial strategies, they're unstable because they destabilize the hierarchy itself, right? And so that is, that is why the bad guy tends to lose, right? And it's not, you know, bad guys win, of course, in real life, this happens, but the, but the general trajectory has been this increasing scope of cooperation and more prestige oriented games, because it is the case that at least here in the Western world and in, and in westernized places, I mean, it, it is the case that uh, we've gotten rid of slavery, right? That's a dominance thing, right? We've gotten rid of it. And, you know, despite the fact that things aren't perfectly fair and perfectly equal, I get that. Despite that fact, you do find uh, a lot of uh, uh, mobility I guess, but you know, people people do rise in the ranks if they if they work hard, right? And and you know, that's like heresy within the academy to say that, but the evidence for it is good. I think uh, that the two of the best predictors of of long term life outcomes are intelligence and conscientiousness, which is basically how smart are you and how hard do you work. Um, and of course, you know, as I said, it, everything's not completely fair, but but it's gotten better, right? We're more prestige oriented now than we were a hundred years ago, for sure, and. 
And the idea is that that's because that that it's because civilizations that take on that strategy outcompete other civilizations. And of course, the West, you know, has outcompeted other civilizations brutally sometimes, and that's a, that's something that we're still dealing with. Right? We're still dealing with our guilt over that brutality, but but it's still the case that we have we have outcompeted other civilizations in that sense. Um, and you know, I think. The well, and, and because whatever what happens is whenever you begin to outcompete by using force, then you fall into the too much order side of the category, and you end up losing your center. Right? You got to yeah. stay on that center, which is that. The, the, this thing's so fascinating about this idea between order and chaos is that there are a lot of things that line up on that border. Mm -hmm. and, and why is it that there are so many things that line up that line up there? And so I've been thinking about that for a long time. Um, as you know, for me, for a long time, I thought it was creativity that is that edge. Creativity is the edge. And creativity, um, over the centuries, it's been observed that certain principles govern creativity in the same way that the physical laws govern the universe. They don't really govern it, but they, <clears throat> they explain or they describe the process of creativity. And they describe the way that creativity communicates between the creative agent and the, the one being communicated to, whether it's the viewer or the listener or the one who eats the food cooked by the chef, you know, there, there's a communication going on between the creative agent and on the other side. Sure. You, you can see this between a mother and a baby, that there's something that happens in that communication process. And that is, it lines up with agape and it lines up with beauty and it lines up with truth and it lines up with goodness. And they're all at this nexus here. Mm -hmm. And I also think it lines up with not exactly information, but the potential for information because it's the potential for information that exists where that line is between order and chaos, where you can go over into chaos or you can see in the chaos something that's going to be useful and good that can be brought back in to- yes revivify the order yes, yes. right so i want to go back to what you said while we talk about beauty here i want to tell you about this really interesting video that i was watching yesterday mm -hmm. there is a thinker by the name of dc schindler dc schindler yeah and i'm going to send you his video and i'll also link it on this on this uh, episode he is He's got an amazing mind. Anyway, he took uh, uh, Aquinas' teachings and kind of collapsed it down into an hour long lecture. <laughs> so, because I've never really studied Thomas Aquinas, but listening to DC Schindler, I can see how many of these ideas of Aquinas line up with this, this truth that we're trying to find right here. And um, it, it connects somehow with this idea of assimilation and accommodation that you were talking about with Piaget. So um, let me find my little notepad here. Like I, it, his teaching is also very dense. So I'm trying to simplify it a little bit here so I may get things wrong, but I'm just gonna try to give you the. Sure. Um, so um, love is the recognition that something is good. Okay, so that's the connection between love and the good. Love is the recognition that something is good, the predisposition to move towards the good. That's what love is. And love precedes every act of will and it precedes every act of physical desire. So he's differentiating between um, will and appetite. And will is the intellect side of um, the intellect side of love and appetite is the physical desire side of love. Okay, so a passion, sometimes people talk about appetites as passions. 
but passion also has the meaning of uh, suffering in the sense that when you say, suffer the little children to come unto me, permit the little children to come unto me, passion is um, a permission in us to be affected by something, okay? So often, so that entails a kind of a sacrifice, that permission to be affected. So love is the first of all the passions because all the other passions presuppose love, which is a disposition towards the good. Love precedes appetite. Now, I think that's a very strange move, but hear, hear me out. Appetite is a movement towards a seeking or a coming out of one's self towards something. So you can have a physical appetite towards something that you want, some food or some sex or, you know, some fancy watch or something like that. But you can also have an intellectual appetite, an intellectual appetite towards some knowledge or some idea. Mm -hmm. That intellectual appetite is classified in his terminology as will, and the physical appetite is classified as desire. Okay, so the soul's relation to the good is appetite. And desire is a movement towards that attraction. So the appetite is changed by the attraction. And here's how it works. Love precedes every appetite. Love is the object's movement toward the soul, the soul being changed by the object of love. So love means that the soul is going to be changed by the object of love. If the object of love is, is a, a, a merely physical appetite, that's going to change the soul in a negative direction. If the object of love is an intellectual appetite, if the object of love is a negative physical appetite, it will change the soul in a negative direction. If the object of love is a positive physical appetite, it will change the soul in a positive direction. And the same with intellect. And Like I said, you, you, you're gonna to have to listen to DC Schindler, but I think there's something here about assimilation and accommodation because assimilation is when our cognitive structure acts in the world, but an accommodation is when the world change, when because of issues in the world, we have to change our cognitive structure. Mm -hmm. So the appetite works in the same way. The soul, the soul works in the same way that the soul is, either using the will to act towards the good or the will is being accommodated to the world in the negative sense, or the will is being changed by the good desire to enlarge and, and have a larger capacity. Mm -hmm. So that change can take place both ways in the soul on the accommodation side. Mm -hmm. And it can take place both ways on the, the other side. So mm -hmm. somehow this idea of, but underneath appetite and desire is love. Love always precedes those things. And that would be the agape. That, that, although he probably is, is tying, you know, in, in the biblical sense, all four kinds of love may be aligned in that thing, you know, um, brotherly love physical love, um, agape love, they all may be connected in there somehow. But I think what DC Schindler is making the argument is that love is more deeply, that beauty is more deeply connected to love than goodness. Because he's making the argument that beauty precedes goodness and truth. Now, I, I, I haven't gotten far enough along in his thinking to see why he thinks that, but he's 
aligning beauty and love. So if love is underneath all of those things that are at the, at the center between order and chaos, then um, love and beauty align somehow. Uh, like I said, I haven't thought the whole thing through yet because I just stumbled on this yesterday. And But then I heard your assimilation and accommodation and I thought it might be good enough. My understanding, my pathetic understanding might be good enough to at least make a placeholder here. And that was good. I can, um, yeah. I can send you the video and we can flesh it out more later. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that Aquinas was having sort of intimations of this idea that you can you can use your structures to act in the world or the world can act on your structures, right? I, I assume you're sort of having, having intimations of that as far as uh, you can do both of those things for for good or for ill. I think that's definitely the case. I think um, the, the linchpin there is whether or not you're acting in truth or not, because uh, you can you can use your cognitive structures to act in the world in falsehood. And and that's that's sort of doing what is expedient rather than what is meaningful. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you can also refuse to change your cognitive structures to to maintain a lie. And there's also this idea that uh, so it's been put forward by a couple of different people. Uh, one of them was Robert Trivers, who is an evolutionary biologist, and he has this idea about self-deception and how self-deception and lying are intimately, are intimately related because, because his contention is that we have evolved to deceive ourselves when we lie because it makes us better liars, right? Um, if I actually somewhat believe my lie, I'm actually better at lying, right? And so, and so the idea there is that that can actually it can work in the short term, uh, but it makes you less fitted to the world in the long term. And so the lie is a way to maintain stability sometimes at the expense of meta stability, at the, at the expense of stability through transformations. Right? And this is what this is uh, related to what Jordan talks about in Maps of Meaning, that the lie is often an act of cowardice. Right? It's an act. Uh, it's 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 trying to maintain something that is no longer worthy of being maintained. Right, it's trying to maintain. Maybe it's your persona, right? Maybe it's it's the way that you look to other people, right? You're you're lying in order to maintain a an illusion, right? Which can which can work in the short term, but it doesn't work in the long term, right? And so, and so, yeah, I do think that you can both assimilate and accommodate in a negative way, right? And and I think that it, that it is intimately connected with with your attitude towards truth or with with your alignment with truth. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's isn't, good. That's, isn't an addiction one of the ultimate lies too? Because uh, John Verveke said something one time that I thought was very compelling that addiction is is a narrowing. Yes. Right, the reciprocal narrowing. Um, yes. And you you can't really become addicted unless you're lying to yourself. Yes, so well, that, addiction, I, yeah. Yeah, and addiction makes you into a liar as well. I mean, it's no secret that alcoholics and, and meth heads are liars, right? They'll lie, they'll do they'll say and do anything to get their fix. Uh, but yes, it is this narrowing and and uh, actually the process by which you become addicted, I think, is almost precisely the same process by which you become uh, ideologically rigid, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's when you're an ideologue, or you're, it's almost like you're addicted to a belief system, right? It's and it's really the same thing. It's this narrowing. And right. so it is sort of this pathology of order. You're trying to maintain, uh, in the case of the ideologue, you're, you're, you're not allowing your belief structures to dissolve. But in the case of the addict, what you have is you have this mode of being where you're reliant on this. And you're not reliant on a belief system, but you're reliant on a drug, let's say, or, or a habit. Uh, and you are, you're not willing to let that go, right? It's, it's narrowed you down to where that's the only thing that's in your, your sort of salience landscape. Uh, and it does turn you into a liar in the same way that the, that that being an ideologue, I think, turns you into a liar. It can't it can't do anything else. Um, well, it starts with a lie and it ends with a lie. <laughs> yeah. It just started going down the vortex until you fall into the bottom of the black hole. And, and then yeah. it's very, very hard to get out. Um, and then he also talks about agape being the reciprocal broadening. And and I think that's uh, that's exactly it, that. I think that's why the 12 step programs are, are at least partially effective with people is that, that they're, they're somehow offering a, a certain understanding of agape to people who are in the program because 
they develop community with one another, but they also um, develop a relationship with the truth when they have to go through the 12 steps, because that's really building a relationship with the truth and finding out where you align with reality. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Then, then your world gets broader and broader because you get outside of yourself and you begin to care about others. And Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. Um, and, you know, the idea that I would put forward about agape, about it being this non-zero-sum game, uh, and I talked about this a little bit with Paul, it's, it's that, you know, if you're enacting this process in your own life, right, you're, you're enacting and embodying the mythological hero figure, right, who stands at the border between order and chaos, right, but the idea of agape, I think, uh, at least in part, is that uh, for me to set it as a goal to see this process enacted in somebody else's life, right, that's an agapic love for that person. And it, it and it does, I think, have this reciprocal broadening uh, effect. But what it, what, it, what it also does is it it allows you to. It's a, it's a non-zero sum game because if you go out in the world and and solve problems, right, and become a heroic, you know, individual, I benefit from that, right, and my, and my family benefits from that. Uh, you know, maybe you go out and and cure diseases or whatever, whatever it may be. You go out and solve problems. We all benefit from that, and so that's a non-zero sum game. And 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 so I think that. Uh, so I think that, you know, if, if Robert Wright is correct, it looks like that's the next step, right? Because it, it, that, that it's the recognition that you can build a community around agape, around this, around the facilitation of the, of the growth and development of each individual. Um, maybe we'll, we'll see, but, um, well, it's not inevitable. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it's, it's inevitable. a lot of intentionality and, uh, and intellect and will and, Sure. And all of that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, oh. Yes. Yes. Uh, but they, and of course, that one of the obstacles to that, uh, I think one of the main obstacles to that, uh, as I said with Paul, is envy, right? Because although I may benefit from your heroic endeavors, right, if you go out and solve problems, you're going to rise in status and, and people are going to give you resources because of that, right? Uh, you're going to gain in prestige and status is a zero sum game, right? It, it you know, if one person has more status, that's that's a relative increase, and and so envy is really an obstacle to this, um, and I think it's I think it's a big obstacle actually. I think that um, the attempt from the ideology that is pervading the universities to, to attack the idea of competence is a manifestation at its at its root is a manifestation of of the envy strategy, right? That's what I that's what I think and. Uh, Jordan has talked about this a little bit. Um, so Friedrich Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche had this idea that after the, the death of God, because of course Nietzsche is famous for declaring the death of God. And what he meant by that was that the, the metaphysical foundations of Western civilization had been sort of blown out by the scientific revolution and by our contact with other cultures. And the idea was that this would not engender skepticism towards only that particular value system, but it would engender skepticism towards all value systems. Because if this one can be blown out, then maybe they're all just relative and arbitrary, right? And so I think he was really, he was really foreshadowing the rise of postmodernism. But the idea that he he would put forward there is that this would lead the logical conclusion of this was a doctrine of radical equality, because what does it mean to say? Uh, that things are, uh, that, that everything is of equal value. Well, I just said it, but, you know, to say that there is no value in the world is to say that things are of equal value, right? And then that crystallizes into this, into this doctrine of radical equality. And he, uh, in, in his book, Thus Spake Zarathustra, he has this chapter called On the Tarantulas. And he talks about, and he calls them the preachers of equality who want to raise their clamor against all that has power and who hide behind their word justice, Right and who uh, and who are motivated primarily by envy. Right, this is what he says in, in that chapter, and uh, I think he hits the nail on the head. I do think that's what's at the root of that ideology, which has been uh, which which Jordan Peterson has come into, let's say, you know, very uh, intense conflict with, right, within the universities. And now I'm not I'm not claiming that for every person who is beholden to the ideology, because many of those many people are like, you know. 19 years old and you go to college and you don't know anything and your professors are these ideologues who who sort of indoctrinate you into this ideology and and you know I was 19 years old once and I was an idiot 
and you know, I, I was an ideologue too, and I, it was a different kind of ideology, but I was actually like sort of into like these, you know, conspiracy theories and stuff. And the point is that 19 year olds are really prone to, to falling into those sorts of things. So I don't blame them, right? It's not, I'm not saying that everybody who's sort of like a, a social justice warrior or whatever is like, is that. I'm saying that's at the core of it though, that I think that the, the architects of the ideology are really, um, that Nietzsche hit the nail on the head when he was describing the motivation behind it. And it is this, and they really are trying to attack the very idea of competence I think, I think, I think one, of the, one of the aspects of ideology that's so dangerous is that because it's an incomplete idea, it's, you know, Jordan calls it an armless body or something like that, that it's, it's an idea that's incomplete, it's missing something, it acts like a virus. And so it's able to penetrate into somebody and start replicating itself. Mm -hmm. Just the way a virus does. And, mm -hmm. and, and these ideologies are super easy to frame with memes and with with very dense zip bombs of uh you know snarky little sayings you can destroy a lot of truth with one of these little zip bombs and so they get implanted in people and they sort of have this viral replication in the end within the individual eating up all of its cognitive structures and then between individuals eating up individuals and i have a I have some friends who've gotten completely eaten up by this bunch of conspiracy stuff to where the people that they were, they're completely gone. There's nothing inside anymore. It's just a shell. And it's, it's kind of terrifying to watch. And I see that happening everywhere on both sides of the political spectrum, certainly. But I'm wondering if there isn't, um, in, in Jordan's idea about the central thing being gratitude and humility, if those with the heroic impulse, you know, John Vervecki is always saying, we don't need more heroes, we need more community. But, so he doesn't agree with Jordan Peterson at all, but, but I think what Jordan Peterson is trying to say is that everybody needs to be a hero. <laughs> It's not that there are certain people that are going to rise up and be the heroes that are going to save us all. He's saying the only way that civilization is going to survive is if every single one of us takes on that responsibility of, of trying to embody the heroic impulse to do good and to reach over into chaos and to capture what's good and bring it back in. And, but if we can act with gratitude and humility, that may buffer some of the envy. Well, yes. I mean, humility is is huge. Well, again, gratitude as well, because I mean, God, you know, one of the things that's so, let's say, frustrating about the about that ideology which has pervaded the universities is the utter lack of gratitude for for Western civilization, uh, despite our mistakes and despite the, the the terrible things that we've done. I mean, I, I agree with that. But you know, the lights are on, and we have three easy easy meals a day, and and you know, nobody's a slave, right? And this is like a, a, a rare thing in the history of the world. It doesn't take much knowledge of history to understand how good we have it. And so there is that lack of gratitude, but, but in terms of like the, you know, along with the conspiracy theory stuff and, and all that, there is a, a, a real lack of humility there, right? Because there is this idea that sort of, we have the truth and everybody else is in a delusion, right? But we, we know the truth, right? And then and there is a sense of, of great certainty about it. And, um, and I know because, <laughs> As I said, when I was 19, I was sort of I was sort of like that, and and it's it's not good, and it and it does alienate people from you. Um, it absolutely alienates people, and uh, and for good reason, right? You don't want to be around somebody like that, right? Because they're not, you know. And and when you're having even like a conversation with somebody like that, you're not really having a conversation, right? Because you're not getting into them at all, right? I mean, they're, they're you know, it's it's a there's a wall there, um, and so yeah, it's it's really bad, and uh, and this idea of you know, yes, I mean, what you want, you know. Uh, I, I've said this to John a little bit, and you know there is no conflict between the hero and the community. Right? What you want is a community of heroes, uh, and and the reason why is because the community, in some sense, is always blind, uh, because a community is defined by boundaries. Right? Uh, you know, a, a community is a community because we are this and we're not that. Right? That that's what defines the community. That is those boundaries. And of course, you need boundaries, right? Boundaries are important. You have to have them, but you have to recognize that they're both, they're both protection, right? They both define you and, and protect you, but they also tyrannize you. 
And uh, the idea is that it is the individual who, uh, who is able to update the boundaries, right? Uh, the individual sees beyond the boundaries of the community and is able to put himself or herself outside of the community in order to, in order to rejuvenate the community. And so, um, and so this is why so often, you know, in, in the canonical hero story, you see that the hero gets away from the community, right? You have to get out, get out and go, go out and have an adventure. And then you can come back to the community with, some, with, with th something new that can rejuvenate the community. Uh, but it is that heroic process that is the process by which the community is updated. And, and of course, yes, I mean, community is important, but, and, and we may have talked about this a little bit the last time, but you know, we, we form communities very easily. Uh, like we're, you know, the Nazis had community, the communists had community, okay, social justice ideologues have community and, and Trump fanatics have community, okay, we were really good at share, uh, at forming communities around a shared aim. And so the question, to my mind, the question is, what should be the shared aim, right, what should be the aim? And this is why I don't think there's any, any uh, conflict between community and philosophical individualism, because to my mind, the proper aim of the community and this is agape, as far as I'm concerned, the proper aim of the community is to facilitate the growth and development of the individual, right? Um, it's not to, you know, form a community around an ideology or something like that, right? It's not, or to like impose an ideology onto the world, which is what many communities form around. It's, it's a community that's, that's formed around facilitating the growth of each individual within the community. And, and I do think that's the proper role of the community um, and that that would be a, a meta-stable community, I think. But, um, I don't know what do you. What I think you, that's the aim and purpose of love. That, that, yes, that's what I would. That's agape, yeah. right? That's that's yeah. the that's the community that puts agape as the highest value, right? And that's what it means. You know, that's what it means is that you're you're trying to enact, you're trying to facilitate that heroic process which within each individual within the community. Um, and so, I mean, when when God created, He said, at every step of the way, He said, "This this is good." And when he created man, he said, this is very good. And so it, it's this disposition towards the good. Love, love as the disposition towards the good is the disposition towards facilitating the growth and development of the image of God because he created us in his image. And as a creator, what's, we are a reflection of his creative impulse. And so it's that create creative impulse that's there at the at the nexus that is calling us to heroic you know we use the word heroic I, I think people get scared of that word but mm -hmm. maybe there's a better word for it but it's that um it's that impulse that's willing to risk and sacrifice and take responsibility and face face our fears and face the darkness. And those are things that are required of every person if they're going to become an individual, if they're not just going to fall back into the mass and be willing to take whatever comes to them. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes, I, wow. I agree. yeah. Um, well, we can maybe talk real quick about, uh, you know, you talked about we're, we're made in God's image, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there is something to that. So, you know, Jordan in, in his uh, conversation, he had a conversation with Dave Shapiro, Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro, mm -hmm. uh, where he, they, they sort of, you know, egged him on to talk about God. And he talked about uh, the spirit of positive masculinity that's involved in the bringing to being of everything. Okay. So, the contention that I would put forward is that that spirit of positive masculinity is what is represented by the mythological hero figure, that the mythological hero figure represents this life, death, and rebirth process, right? And that process is what underlies the, the ongoing creation and complexification of the universe, and that it is masculine. Uh, the, the reason why it's masculine, well, partly for the reason that Jordan put forward, but uh, this is actually an idea that I'm going to be talking about in the book, uh, that I'm writing. Um, so John Verbeke has put forward this idea of the agent arena relationship. Uh, so the agent arena relationship, I'm going to talk about it a little bit differently than John does, but but it's it's a really good idea. I think that this is a very fundamental relationship. Who are we as agents? What is our role in the world? And what is the world to us? Right? What is the arena that we're in? 
well, the way that this has been represented mythologically is that the agent is masculine and the arena is feminine, yeah, yeah. right? And, and so this is why you have mother nature, mother earth, right? The word matter comes from the same root word as mother, right? And so the arena is feminine. The arena is the container that we're in, but the agent in the agent arena relationship is, is masculine and it's represented in, in mythology by the mythological hero figure. And so the idea is that that is a representation of this process that underlies the ongoing complexification of the world. And it's the interaction between that process and the material, right? And the, and the material is not, you know, it actually, it actually really lines up really well with, with quantum theory, uh, this idea. And, and when you get into quantum theory, you sort of risk sounding like Deepak Chopra, but I'm not Deepak Chopra, so whatever. You know, the idea of quantum, with quantum theory is that uh, matter is not as solid as we think it is, that it is this, it is this sort of manifestation of probabilities, right? It's, it's, it's indeterminate, right? At a very fundamental level, it's indeterminate. And so that's the, that's the underlying chaos. It's the chaos that underlies everything. Um, and of course, the great mother, right, in Jordan's scheme is chaos. Now, the, the process, right, that process that runs through it is the ordering process. That's the process that makes order out of chaos, right? That's the spirit of positive masculinity, right? And that's God, as far as I can tell. And, and so I think that Jordan was, was right when he said that. And, and so that is, uh, and, and see, that is, you know, the, the, the true the good and the beautiful all emerge from that process, from the interaction between that process and the underlying potentiality, right? See, it's the underlying, uh, the, the feminine that underlies it and the masculine process interact to produce the true, the good and the beautiful. Um, and so, and I think this lines up really well with the, with the, with actually with mythological narratives. Um, uh, because it is the case that the agent is generally represented as masculine and the, and the arena is feminine. So I don't know, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think about that, if that. Oh, it, it totally lines up with everything that I've, I've been, I've probably got a hundred videos on here now. And so <clears throat> I've been exploring this, this way that all these different levels line up. So I've, I've talked to physicists and biologists and chemists and, and <clears throat> I'm, when I'm, when I'm talking to them, I'm not always, talking about what my ideas are, but I'm always listening for where, where things line up. <clears throat> and every time I talk to any of these people, everything just lines up in this exact space. Mm -hmm. and, and it lines up whether we're talking about the way the neurons operate in the nose and the eye, or whether we're talking about um, the complexity of biochemical evolution or, you know, it just every single thing that I talk to people about all these things line up in the same space. So, and, and I do think that there's something very central to all of these elements and principles of design, because that matrix of, of elements and principles plays out in all these levels. You, you see, and, and I could take each one of these items and I could write a chapter about each one of them if I was more responsible and <laughs> dedicated. But as it is, I just think this stuff through all the time. And I oftentimes I don't even take the time to write it down because it's all in my head. Um, but it, um, I think what you just said makes perfect sense about the, the quantum, you know, being the, the potential and the agent and the, you know, the masculine and the feminine, um, it, you obviously see it playing out in the birth of a child. You obviously see it playing out in the seed and the tree. You, you see it playing out at every level of biological reality for certain, but you also see it in the, in the non-organic. Um, it's, which is what makes me think that it's, You know, you have the complete materialists who think that this is all just some random accident, and I'm like, no, it can't possibly be because it's all, <laughs> it's all, it's all the same thing. It all boils down to the same thing, and the thing that it boils down to is, I when I talk with, I, I have a lot of these conversations with a guy named Michael on my channel. There is a looping when you look at any of these things. There's this looping, and it's the same looping that Jordan Peterson talks about when he says it's the hero who rises up to the top of the hierarchy, 
if he's a true hero, he responsibly comes back down to the bottom and brings people back up with him. And so there's always this communication that's going on. Mm -hmm. There's always a communication. And um, I have many other ways in all the, that all these things line up, which we don't have time to talk about right now. But I think that beauty, truth, and goodness line up with faith, hope, and love. Not in that order. I'd have to reorder it in my mind to show you how the three line up. But all of those things line up. And uh, it's an interesting pursuit for sure. Now, I understand you're going back to school on Monday for your doctorate. Uh, how much right. time do you have left before you're finished? Do you have an idea? Uh, a long time. So this is my second semester. So I've got four okay. and a half years left. Yeah. Four and a half so years. You're, you're guessing that that's how long it's going to take you on your thesis or your dissertation? Uh, so it, it always, um, you always go for at least five years. It could take longer than that. I, I expect to be done within the five years though. So it's uh, I'll have my master's and I'll have my master's next year and then I start on my PhD and then I start on my PhD thesis after that. Uh, so it, it will take at least four and a half years, but I, I yeah. assume I'll be done. I'll, I'll yeah. see you at the end of that. <laughs> yeah. Do you have yeah. your dissertation worked out already? What you're going to be doing? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to be talking about, but for my, master the for my master's thesis, I do. Um, so we haven't talked too much about this, but I, I do research on the diametrical model of autism and psychosis. Uh, it actually lines up with this stuff because it looks to me like autism and autistic traits are a specialization for order, essentially, and schizotypal traits on the psychosis end of the continuum are, are a specialization for chaos, essentially. Wow. Uh, the people on either of those ends. Yeah, and so and so we're creating a scale to measure this in, in non-clinical populations. Uh, so that's what I'm doing for my master's. The thing I, I love about this whole train of thinking is that once you have this key, you can use it to unlock anything. Yes. Uh, so it is, I think, the what you could call an ER problem formulation, right? It's it's a it's a it's it's the most basic way to formulate problems, right? You can you can you can look at almost anything and you can and you can diagnose it as having too much order, too much chaos, right? And it's uh, and this is what they were this is what the the Chinese were getting at with the Tao, right? At least in part. Um, uh, and, and interestingly enough, they also associated order and chaos with the masculine and the feminine, right? Um, but yes, it, it is a, it is the key that unlocks many doors, right? And it really does at every because it, it does manifest at every level of analysis. So, well, and, and yesterday I was having a great conversation with a, a guy who's a, who does both physics and math, and we're trying to get at what life is in its essence. What makes life from non-life. And um, he was talking about that the question and the answer are at the base of everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, because he said a lot of materialists say that one and zero are at the base of everything, but it's really not one and zero because even when people are doing computation, it always is a question looking for an answer, a question looking for an answer. and as we're talking just now, it goes, oh yeah, that all lines up because the feminine, I don't know if you've ever listened to Jonathan Pajot talk, the role of the feminine is to frame the question. Mm -hmm. And then the role of the masculine is to find the answer, frame the question, find the answer, frame the question. So it completely lines up that the question is the chaos that underlies everything, the place where all the, conclusion I've come to is that the chaos is the place where all new information lies. And yeah. so then the all the new information is there and the question draws the answer. And so so you have this looping again. So yeah. Yeah. Well yeah, that's, that's really good. I have a hard stop at 11 and we're there now. So um this has been a great conversation, Brett. I have greatly profited from it. It's helped me to clarify a lot of my thinking and I hope it's been profitable for you as well. It certainly has. Yeah. Yeah. And have a wonderful next semester. And Thank you. I'm so excited to read your first book. <laughs> yeah. Well it'll be a while, but I'll I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. See bye bye. You.